think I'm missing in the computer. I'll sit so down I can so I can controls. Yeah, so I, so you can so I can mess with you. you can I mess haven't with been me. here in a long time. Yeah, it's been a while. I'm gonna sit. Oh, it's bright. So what's this piece that you're working on? I'm reworking one of my old pieces. This uh, is well, us. You know, I'd rather sit to the la lady. We can put Scott out there. I don't need to sit next to him. <laughs> <laughs> I talk to him all the time. I don't. So you're chances. Bobby. Yes. I'm Rosie. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. In person. So it's what's great. so so? How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. excited. So, so were you already here? Did you drive up this morning? I or? drove here. I just dropped off my kids and headed this yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, I'm gonna be here early. Yeah, that's good. Good. Yeah. Yeah, right. Where do you where do you live? I'm in North Chicago. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so you had so a hike. It was a drive, you know, a little podcast. Listening. Yeah, that's true. But, that's true. Yeah, but it was safe. Yeah. But I already got here safely. Well, I had know? three classes today. Y'all make me feel bad. I, I was just to, late. I was just regular late. I mean, I teach. Uh, <laughs> I had to teach three classes. I had almost. Uh, that I had, I had two classes of 50, mm. and then I have a class of 25, and so rather, I mean, so rather than to drive from Whitewater here, I decided to trick them, and I did online. Mm. So you know, from Whitewater to here, mm. it's an hour and some change. Oh, mm -hmm. okay, okay. Uh, from Milwaukee to here, it's 40. It's like half hour. I thought about asking if I could come with you, yeah, and I realized so you probably were coming from somewhere. Well, what happened is I would have been in Whitewater. Okay, welcome. Oh. Thank you. Welcome to today's event. It's a panel um, in collaboration with Black History Month here at Parkside uh, with the College of Arts and Humanities, as well as the Mahogany Gallery and the Black Art and Culture Expo. Everybody give a round of applause. Thank you. So today's panel is focused on making money and building your career as a black artist, talking about both challenges and successes. So before we begin, we also want to identify and acknowledge our sponsors for the event, which is S.C. Johnson. We have United Way of Racine County, Patent Law Offices, Public Allies, Freydert, and the Medical College of Wisconsin. And our moderator for today is Matope Johnson. Matope's educational background includes an MFA degree from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, Peck School of the Arts, Department of Art and Design, as well as a BFA degree from the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater, where Matope is currently a staff lecturer and a coordinator of inclusive excellence and diversity for the College of Arts and Design Department. Please welcome Mutope Johnson. Wow, thank you so much. Can you hear me even like that? Okay, good. I wasn't sure whether the, the mic volume was up and whether or not I needed to pull it uh, closer to me. So uh, bear with me, um, but I wanna thank you all for being so brave, one, to come out uh, during uh, this little light snow that's out there, but it still sometimes can be kind of uh, hard to, na to navigate when you had stuff blowing in your, in your face. But, and then also to uh, brave the, uh, the, the opportunity to be with one another. You know, I actually miss um, this personal contact, and so I want you to uh, give yourselves a, a round of applause for just being brave and coming out and being with either, each other. Okay, so uh, before we get started, I always like to find out, especially on subjects like this when we're talking about artists who uh, are emerging and trying to make a go at it, because what we do is, is kind of tough. It's not easy taking on uh, uh, the professional role as an artist, whether it's music, theater, dance, or the visual arts. So first of all, I wanna identify all of the the artists or people that like to embrace creativity, could you raise your hand so at least I know that you're in the house? 
Okay, good, good, good. That, that's you too, Rose. Right. That's you too. <laughs> that's you too. So we, we're all going to claim it. We're going to just claim it today. So um, again, I just want to be uh, uh, cognizant of um, everybody that's present and really want to thank um, uh, all the sponsors, uh, the uh, UW Parkside and the, uh, um, the, the panelists here. And so I've got these slides up, but for the most part, I want to just uh, acknowledge the fact that in, in collaboration with uh, Mahogany Gallery and, and, and uh, Scott Terry, who uh, he and I go back a number of years, I'm not going to tell you how many because it's going to date both him and myself. We want to appear to be much younger. So, uh, but uh, again, I want to thank the uh, Office of uh, Multicultural Affairs and the uh, College of Arts and uh, Humanities. So it's been a while since I've actually been on the, on the college campus. And so it's great to be uh, in your presence. So bear with me while I try at least to introduce our panelists because I think that uh, you might find uh, these individuals to be uh, engaging and um, really uh, here to offer some insights into their careers. We're all trying to learn, we're all trying to grow. And so for the most part, this is really just a, a peek into our lives just briefly. And so if you uh, just bear with me. So this is, to my left is Vavi Solomon. You know, she is uh, trying to brand herself, and I think she's probably doing a good job as Vasol. Yeah. That's who she is. <laughs> <laughs> and so as an artist, uh, you know, Vas says, I have uh, held a high emotional bond with my work. Inspirations such as Salvador Dali, Hebrew Brantley from Chicago, right? Yeah, that's, uh, which is where you're, uh, you're from North Chicago. And uh, uh, Lois Half, is that uh, someone that I, we should be familiar with? Uh, it all played yeah. a part in, in, my, uh, in her stride. Um, she enjoys mediums such as fine art, hand-drawn, digital illustration, as well as abstract painting. Uh, bridging these styles and mediums uh, has allowed her to uh, express herself and become a unique form uh, of its own, so her style has become uh, unique in that respect. I'm going to, you know, kind of toggle through so we can actually see uh, some of uh, Vaz's work. So here's my sponsors. want to make sure that we thank everybody from the, the offices. Okay, can you all see those? Okay, good. want to thank everybody. And so let me go to, let me go to Va real quick. There you go. Here's Va right there. Alrighty, so you can read along, but I put a briefer version of her uh, uh, biography up. So in 2009, as a graphic des uh, design major at uh, Watkins College of Art and Design, uh, Vi was able to study film and began creating cover art for musicians and leading into mixed media work, and that includes photography and video. In 2013, her first solo show uh, was launched in Waukegan, Illinois, which is uh, right down the road from us. Described as a raw expression of self-study and, and healing through creative arts, uh, Vaso displayed a variety of mediums from canvas paintings to music. Uh, this evoked the uh, evolution of a career, uh, and not only as an artist, but as a, a wellness advocate. And uh, I've seen you on, on Instagram, you know, I saw you posing. Okay. <laughs> I saw you posing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I checked you out. So let's look at some of Vi's work here. Okay, this is just a little bit, you know, I put a little bit of a snapshot in here just to kind of give you an idea. I know you didn't know I was, you know, I'll be checking you out. You said follow you. That's what you said. So that's what I did. Okay, and so to my right is, I'm going to skip through Scott because we know Scott already. Let me go back to here. Let me go. Oh, I got to get back to my Rosie. There you go, Miss Petrie. So to my right is Rosie Petrie. She and I are, you know, we've been, you know, I think the only a person that I'm really just getting to know is Vaso, you know, but, you know, these two, we go back a ways, I know them. So Rosie is, you know, I, I love Rosie. Rosie is a mom, she's an artist, she's a storyteller. Uh, from Milwaukee, and in 1921, or I'm what, sorry, <laughs> 2021. Don't want to, don't want to make you older than I am. Okay, Petrie uh, served as the inaugural artist in residence at uh, uh, Bell Hooks, the center in uh, Brea College uh, in Kentucky. Uh, and in 2020, she uh, was selected as a Mary Noel Emerging Artist Fellow and uh, Mildred L. Harpo Artist of the Year from the City of Milwaukee. That's the uh, Milwaukee Arts Board. 
and you got uh, that as well. Well, you know, I was on the board for a okay. while, but you know, uh, it's a it's a, a a title that is really given to artists who have been uh, making quite a headway uh, in in the the city and the state. So, again, these are just really brief. Uh, uh, biographies of these artists, they actually have a lot more than words can explain. We'll get a chance to dive into some of that. And so in uh, 2019, uh, the 11th um, Fister Artist in Residence program was uh, uh, able to allow um, uh, Rosie to create a space and showcase uh, her fabric portraits, uh, record podcast interviews, and celebrate traditions of the African American uh, diaspora and uh, you know, Rosie was a uh, Milwaukee artist and resource network um, a mentee. So she was in the uh, artist um, mentor, mentee program, uh, which I happen to be a part of too. So that was a, a great experience. Uh, she was actually a, a mentee of Della Wells, who most of you, if you follow uh, the art world at all, know that Della Wells is uh, pretty, uh, she thinks of herself as a provocateur. And uh, Rosie's work can be viewed in several uh, prominent Milwaukee locations. Uh, uh, recently, you were also represented by a gallery in Atlanta, is that correct? See, that probably wasn't in here, but I do have that in here, too. Um, <laughs> including the Fister Hotel, Northwestern Mutual Giving Gallery, uh, the African American Chamber of Commerce, um, the Milwaukee County Courthouse, uh, and so many others. So uh, it's a pleasure to have Rosie sitting right next to me. So you notice I put the two ladies on my side, and I put the dude way over there. <laughs> So, Scott Terry is next. Uh, Scott Terry is the founder and owner of uh, Mahogany Gallery. And uh, it's a contemporary fine arts gallery located in Racine. And uh, Mahogany exhibits the work of emerging and established uh, black visual artists and other indigenous artists of color. So this was established in 2019 and Mahogany is a premier exhibition space in southeast uh, Wisconsin and the only black owned arts uh, gallery in the Racine and Kenosha areas. So his artwork often is more of a narrative about artistic documentation of black people and, and culture in all of its forms, and at times, uh, critical views of social, political, and cultural issues. Uh, this takes center stage in his work, and um, uh, a great deal of that is uh, black history and culture, uh, because it's also an American history, as well as world history. And he uses his work uh, to educate and build uh, and explore themes about uh, well, black people. Uh, and, uh, but I've seen you do some landscapes too, so you're not just one dimensional. Uh, <laughs> so he has more recently been particularly in it, and interested in the image of uh, the black male uh, in society, and we know the struggles that uh, many of us face just stepping out the door. And uh, one will see many images of black males in his work, but we'll get a chance to dive into uh, the work of these three artists. Uh, and so uh, just give them a round of applause for being here. <laughs> So we'll take it. So here's some of Rosie's work, by the way. And, uh, you know, so let's go back and take a look at that. So she's got a, you know, quite a range. This is just, we don't, we're not even touching the tip of the iceberg here. And so let me go. This is, uh, uh, here is uh, Scott Terry. Good, good. So it kind of gives you an idea. All righty. So let's, let's dive in. So first and foremost, you know, I wanted to make sure that we are all on the same page. Um, you know, there are these myths about artists, and I want to start off by uh, talking to our panelists and getting them to uh, answer some of these questions. I hear it all the time. The myth about artists and other uh, misconceptions. And so, you know, I, I created these questions, and I probably have more questions than not, but I figured that we'd just take a deep dive in and look at uh, some of the myths first and see if we can solve uh, some of these issues. Okay, so myth number one. Uh, do you have to starve to create relevant art? <laughs> so anyone again? I guess so while you want to go, we'll pull that mic a little closer to you. And so, you know, I definitely feel like that's a myth. Um, my experience as an artist, I feel like that perception from the outside looking in at an artist, like the sometimes the disorganized, frazzled look and even a laziness of sorts that may come across is from a lot of mental things going on. It's more internal and that 
that idea of starving is more so because instead of you're feeding yourself what the world says you have to feed yourself, you're feeding yourself something else and you're mm -hmm. putting your energy in other things and it's you just have to push and push to, to show the world enough that they value that mm -hmm. and it depends on the artist if that even matters to them or not. But I think it's definitely a myth that you have to starve. Um, I had to switch my perspective from seeking someone to value my art, to value it so much that I realized that, you know, the things that I desire and that I deserve could be achieved through my art. And I had to be in my own space with that thought and not really take in the outer perceptions. So Rosie? I think in late stage capitalism, we don't have a choice to be starving artists. Um, a starving artist is just a person who's not a working artist. It's a business, it's a job. You have to show up, you have to do things you don't wanna do. Um, I think when people think about starving artists, there is this kind of mentality mm -hmm. of uh, this very romantic, like absorbed creative person who doesn't have any context or con content within the actual world. And in order to get to do this as a job every day, I have to treat it like a job and show up like a job. Um, I have to do paperwork. I have to do meetings, I have to keep a really tidy calendar, I have to be on time for deadlines, I have to handle contracts, there's so much to it that if you're not willing to show up for the business of being an artist, you're going to be a starving artist. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Scott? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I argue with, you know, all the sentiments shared by Vine and Rosie. Um, I think, um, you know, that's a romanticized, uh, you know, stereotype, you know, if you will, uh, of being, uh, not having to have, um, you know, the resources or, you know, feeling as though, like you, you know, I get all the time, like, you know, it's not a, you know, being a creative is not a real job, but it's not a, you know, mm -hmm. a real path to personal success or financial success. And I think that's, you know, in, in, in my experience, um, you know, I think we all can sort of attest to, you know, there's, there's growth, you know, right? You know, you have to start somewhere. And so the beginning stages may be sort of, you know, of, you know, famine, you know, but if you really believe in yourself, you know, believe in your work and believe in your craft and willing to, you know, put in the work, like Rosie mentioned, put in the work, um, then, you know, uh, within that abundance mindset, you know, you can really create so many different opportunities, you know, for yourself. So um, I think that's just a part of the process of being an artist. Okay, so I'm gonna keep it moving too. So uh, how about this one? Uh, should artists care about doing business? That's one of those questions that, you know, becomes, uh, <laughs> you know, Well, if you like, wanna thrive <laughs> and yeah. not, you know, lose your mind, it's important, you know, especially um, personally, um, in the later years of my work, I started realizing that my core beliefs, in my opinion, weren't really being conveyed. I wasn't catering to the right spaces to give my work. And in order to do that, I had to network. I had to, you know, really pay attention to the identity that I had on social media mm -hmm. and, you know, update my resume, update, you know, my artist bio, make sure that people are relevant to where my mind was currently in my work. And that helped release the pressure that comes with wanting to be a business because mm -hmm. if you're really genuine, your energy shows with the work that you're willing to put in. Yeah. I want you to answer before <laughs> I do. Okay, what, I'm sorry, what's the question again? The question is, should artists care about doing business? Because a lot of times it's, you know, artists like to be purists sometimes. It's all about the feeling, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's all about expression. Um, should they care about the business? Well, I mean, if this is what they want to do, you know, if this is what your, you know, path is, or this is what you feel as though you want to spend your energies on and your resources on, then, you know, I would say yes. You know, and I think, you know, one of my roles with the gallery is that, you know, I also represent artists too. So, you know, I'm an artist agent, and I get that a lot with other artists. Um, you know, my experience has shown me that, you know, everyone is different with their, where they are in their art journey and their career and the goals are different. You know, not every artist has that business acumen. Um, mm -hmm. Some want to, um, but just don't know where to start. Some have zero desire. Um, but I, in, in my experience, I think the ones who, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the artists who, you know, commit to learning and growing um, their practice, have some sense of commitment to 
growing the business side you know, of, of the art. So I'm, I'm going to double up on this question here because I'm also going to be cognizant of time because at the end I want to make sure that we've got room for questions and uh, I know we got a little bit of a late start. I don't know whether we actually can uh, uh, get back some of our time, but nevertheless, uh, how about this question here? How about is making money uh, from your art selling out? Because I've had you know some of my and maybe this is probably Maybe it's an old school thing, but you know, um, I've had friends that were, you know, purists, and they thought, well, okay, if I go too commercial, you know, um, you know, would that be like selling out if I go commercial? Is that, you know, is that a thing with you? Or? It probably is old school. Mm -hmm. yeah, just, I'm is. just saying, you yeah. know, because now <laughs> one of the biggest tools is social media, mm -hmm. and it's like one of the it's sometimes <clears throat> a second nature to want it to be merch or you know yeah. to spread things out mm -hmm. and that usually comes with well am i you know pouring into myself while i'm pouring mm -hmm. out and that's usually where my, my mindset comes from because i want to expand i want to be in all rooms and share the message that i have you know through my art so it kind of would be counterproductive to think of it as a sellout yeah i you know i've heard that before but you know i had to tell some of my friends that the only thing that i'm selling out is the stuff that I'm making. Right. <laughs> so that's just right. a bit real. But what do you, what, 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 what do you think? Though? I think it's a two part. So that first part of the question mm -hmm. of like, you know, do you have to do the business? And also if you do the business, are you selling out? Mm -hmm. I think realistically, anyone who wants to be an artist can in fact be an artist. Like you right now, if you are a practitioner of creativity, you are an artist. However, if you want to have an art career, you mm -hmm. have to do art business. Yeah. If you don't know how to do art business, then your job is to find out what that entails. So whether that's a mentorship, whether that's studying, whether that's taking classes, whether that is approaching a gallery and asking for a portfolio review, um, you have to do something. You don't have to do everything, but you can do art without doing business. Now, if you're going to be an artist in business, you do have to think about money. Um, and that's where like, so a relationship, for example, with a gallery is helpful if you don't know everything. But you also have to think about like the history of creative people being exploited. And you have to know enough to know what you want for your career. So when you have these partnerships, you make the right choices to go the direction you want to. So you can do business, mm -hmm. you can be an artist, you can still be a normal person, and you can get support. Right. Okay. All right. So I got one, I got one for you, Scott. Here's, here's one. Here's about this. Uh, does giving art away in, in exchange for exposure help your career? It's like, okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it is what it is. It's a yeah. real question. Um, well, <laughs> yeah. um, I'm typically of the mindset of run me that check. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but there's a reason for that. No, but there's, there is, um, you know, it's, it's a case-by-case -case basis. You know, it's, it's really, yeah. you know, up to that particular artist and what the situation is. You know, what are the potential ramifications for, you know, saying yes or saying no, mm -hmm. um, you know, how does that create win-win situations? And I'm always about, you know, creating win-win situations and relationships. Um, so, you know, I, I've done that personally, you know, um, and, you know, there's probably instances where I'll probably do it again. Um, but, you know, ultimately though, it's, I think the, the other piece of that conversation is that we also have to uh, stress the importance of paying for that work you know, as well, mm -hmm. um, because historically, as black artists in America, you know, that hasn't happened. You know, yeah. the whole lexicon of black artists in America is just, um, you know, collectively has, has been void of that. You know, we know so many stories of that, you know, in the past. So I think, you know, it, it's, it's a case-by-case -case basis on the artist, but, you know, I think it's important to artists to, for, uh, you know, black artists particularly, but artists in general, you know, but black artists specifically to know the, the roots and the ancestry of black artists in America mm -hmm. and, you know, what their forefathers and, you know, and foremothers have done um, and the journeys they have created and uh, had to work through. And, you know, it's just so many artists I can pick up off the top of my head right. Um, right. that really paved the way. Um, so maybe I'm digressing a little bit, but no, I just want to really add you're, that. You're good. But, okay, how about this? I, so I asked this question uh, for all of you, uh, and this is for the audience too, really. Uh, are artists uh, temperamental and weird? <laughs> you know, are they, is it kind of a special kind of crazy? Yes. 
Um, <laughs> I say that because my experience, yeah. like you never, with mm -hmm. me, my art changes so much. And um, when I first started, my particular style or genre was realism. Mm -hmm. And I fell into illustration and doing caricatures. And my first job was working at Six Flags doing caricatures. And that just awakened me and reminded me how much I actually enjoyed cartoons and things like that. Mm -hmm. And that blended me over into animation and 3D. It's so many things. And if I waited for someone to give me permission, I would never have found, you know, how much I love these things or trying to explain why I'm changing so much, say, per se, like people watching me on social media. Wow, she changes so much. Wow, Vaso, like who is that? I know Bobby Solomon. Well, let me just do my thing. You know, like you know, it, it just takes a moment to just own who you are and embrace it. And if weird is, weird is a compliment to me. I think born I'd rather not be, yeah, you know, gotcha. so, gotcha. yeah, Keep, it, keep sure. it exciting, keep it. Yeah. So, Rosie, are we weird? Are we, are we temperamental? Weird is subjective. Yeah? I think everyone else is weird. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think artists might, might get the weird stick, mm -hmm. but I think it's right. really about having, like, an inner life and being really right. kind of having a lot going on behind the scenes that maybe right. people don't know, yeah. and then they get the output. But all of that stuff that is inside that's happening that makes you make work for a certain reason or maybe once you, you want to ask questions and then you want to find out the answer, I think that is kind of core to being an artist and that yeah. can be a little unorthodox. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, I thought, you know, looking at my community, I'm like, well, you know, there's not a black on art gallery. That's weird, you know, in, in Racine. And uh, so I kind of set out to, you know, fix that. But I think, yeah. Yeah. So, yes. you, so you're just subscribing to that. Yeah. Okay. I think that's a good thing, though. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's fine. So here's, here's a thought. So various forms of art uh, have different effects on people and can be viewed as a particular type of visual code. And so, uh, Scott, you and I were talking about that the other day, and I think part of it, I think the key word here is, you know, is there, uh, I guess this is the question, what types of visual code or African-American aesthetic does your work include, if any? Because uh, I, I notice I look at all three of your work and it's all vastly different, but, you know, is there something in there that, you know, uh, it's not necessarily subliminal images, but iconography or, you know, there's something that we should be paying attention to? Well, I think, you know, I can kind of go back to my sort of, you know, roots as a budding artist and some of my influences. You know, I remember, you know, there was a phenomenal artist, which everyone here should know, by the way, his name is Ernie Barnes. So Ernie Barnes was a... Um, you may know some of his iconic work is uh, uh, the cover art for the TV show Good Times. Uh, so most people know him for that, uh, but he's, he's, his, body is work, his body of work is just amazing. That's just only one sliver of, of, his, his, of his work. But to answer that question, you know, Matope, I, I think, um, you know, connecting with Ernie Barnes' style and his expressiveness, and like I see that within my own family, I see that within you know our culture, you know the diversity of blackness, and you know black not being a monolith, but also like you know the juke joints, you know yeah. talking to my granddaddy about you know his younger days, and we I can connect with those things, right. you know, and sure. um, those were central to some of, some of Arnie Barnes's work. So I think um, you know ultimately I think may see some of those styles or similarities or, you know, context in, in my work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Rosie, because I, I know that you, uh, your exploration in art history has kind of revealed a lot of uh, clues and things about history and uh, people that you've profiled in particular when uh, you... Yeah, I, would, I went to college, um, it was a long time ago, I didn't finish. Good job, you all, welcome, welcome to be here. <laughs> Um, but I remember I was in my first art history course in college and there was a section in the book about black history and I was, this was an advanced level course and they're like, we're just going to skip this because it's actually not important. I was the only black student in the class. Right. Okay. Um, obviously I didn't continue going to that school, but what I realized is a lot of the time, um, for me, what I'm interested in is the black cultural experience. And what that means to me is it includes components that are about food. It's about music, it's about style, because we are, we're stylish. We're interested in the presentation and the experience. So for my work, I use African wax prints. Um, I do a little bit of block printing. I do iconographic representations of, of folks that I think are historically important. Um, I do a lot of musicians. 
uh, black women musicians specifically, but then also, you know, we make room for other grades. And then civil rights movement pieces. So that's kind of mm -hmm. where that stuff kind of falls in for me. Yeah, and, and Va, you, you're, you, you're pretty eclectic. You're, you're in a, a number of places. I mean, you, you respond to some of those, uh, um, you know, kind of social media, kind of uh, follow me kinds of things and mm -hmm. um, being present. Uh, but your work also, you know, gets into, as you mentioned before, illustration and graphic design and mm -hmm. you know merchandising and you know yeah, so but yeah. is there something that we should be looking for is there some code or visual code that you know is present for me with my art i'm kind of uh that medicine in the candy type mm -hmm, of approach mm -hmm. so um there are times where i like to challenge my skill and do a portrait of like a buzzword type mm. of person or something of that nature but more so to attract people to look at the other pieces because i have so many things and a lot of it explores emotion. Mm. And I think that there's been a lot of experiences in you know, black culture where we're forced to not go too deep into our passions mm -hmm. and, our, and our expressions of our sadness and our depression and things of that. And that's pretty counterproductive to growing as a human being. Mm. So um, I really put that in my work mm. And um, I'm making more aim to not be that silent artist mm. that you only see their work because right. that can be cool, but I, I'd rather speak and, and really let people know who the artist is because we didn't have the privilege, privilege of knowing a lot of artists until they were gone. Yeah. And I think, you know, when you can relate to someone's words and, and see them and see the art, uh, no matter what, you know, they really are looking in difference to yourself, you know, it just matters to connect that way. I think that's important. You know, I wanted to add something too real quick on that, the mm -hmm. visual code piece. You know, what, one thing... I've been doing some uh, DNA research on you know my family, and we came across the the white slave owners of my an ancestors. Yeah, I just saw that. And, I, and that was, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that that was deep. You know, it was and so and the reason I mentioned that is because you know getting back to my work, one of my favorite pieces. I didn't, I sold it, and it, it took. I had it for years, mm -hmm. and I purposely did not sell because it, it was actually a portrait of my. Uh, childhood upbringing of my grandparents mm -hmm. in, 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 in South Georgia. Mm -hmm. And I had, I refused a lot of inquiries of people who wanted to buy it. Um, and so when I talk about uh, this visual code, you know, it's really about, for me, um, like uplifting, mm -hmm. you know, our ancestors, uplifting what they went through, mm -hmm. and really like acknowledging that through our work mm -hmm. and understanding that we have you know, we have a role, like we have, we play a role in that now as contemporaries um, to continue that story of uplifting through our work mm -hmm. and hoping that, uh, you know, the next generation will continue. So that, that legacy and that history is never mm -hmm. uh, forgotten. Yeah, that's interesting. So here, here's something else to think about. So the, the following uh, visual artists, especially now, this is a good segue to be able to do that. Um, these are visual artists, uh, past and present, that are... Uh, really have had some breakthroughs in, in their career. And so most of uh, you may be familiar with them, but if you're not, here is a, a, a glimpse of some of those artists uh, that we have become familiar with and, and we think of as blue chip or, or iconic. And I'll just kind of toggle through some. Bisa. So Bisa Bella. Yeah. <laughs> I know that's your Shiro, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to get like so, her yeah. when I grow up. So, so here's some of the, here's some of her work here. Yeah. And then of course there's uh, Romare Bearden. Yeah, one of my favorites, right? Yeah, some of his uh, his work, and then there's uh, Jacob Lawrence. Yeah, yeah, and there's some of his work. Yeah, this uh, migration series, which is uh, you know an iconic body of work, and then Charles White. You know, who uh, of course, yeah, I want to grow up to be like Charles White too. Yeah, some of Charles White's work. Yeah, really powerful. And you talk about iconography and uh, a visual code. Um, so Biggers, yeah, T. Biggers, yeah. you know, yeah. And Stanford, who, who is, uh, you know, his uh, younger cousin, uh, happened to be in, uh, came to Milwaukee, had a chance to spend some time with him. So here's uh, John Bigger's work here. Yeah, and of course, you know, we know, we're familiar with Kerry James Marshall, right? Yeah, and is this the piece that Pete Diddy bought, I believe, for a whole lot of money? Yeah, that's the one, yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. And then, of course, uh, G. Michelle Basquiat, yeah, so. Of course. And everybody can relate to this piece, yeah. Uh, a hundred plus million dollars, right? I sold uh, that much in our last yeah, week. Yeah, that's a lot of money. Uh, right. Amy Sherrill. <laughs> yeah. you, know, you probably know Amy for, for this, this portrait. Right. 
yeah, of uh, Michelle Obama. And then, of course, uh, Kahindi follows right be, uh, behind. Oh, yeah, now, he did the uh, Obama portrait, but, you know, this is one of his, his more monumental pieces here, you know. Um, yeah, just incredible. But also, I wanted to kind of, you know, sew this up a little bit and say that, you know, there's a bunch of uh, artists here in Wisconsin, too, that we should recognize. I, I don't know if you can actually see uh, the names of these individuals, but these are, you know, bo both, um, um, uh, I'd say, multi-generational, multi-ethnic uh, artists who have had contributions, uh, breakthroughs in their careers, uh, many of them, uh, you know, uh, we have gotten to know over, yeah. over the years. And then there's many others, so I, I don't want to, uh, you know, leave anybody out there, but, you know, because this would, list would be tremendously long if I had to name everybody. Did you put I mean, yourself on there? Well, no, I didn't do that. Uh, and, and then, uh, I don't want Trent to be mad at me, but I can put Trent and his brother Reggie. In so Trent is out there somewhere. And so he, this is partly where we're taking this. You know, as artists, and especially emerging artists, and so uh, this question is not on there, but when does one emerge as an artist is really uh, a tougher question. Just think about that for a moment. But we have to transform how we think. And so here's some things that might uh, be able to uh, help us answer that question. We'll let our panelists uh, discuss that. So what do, you, what do you bring to the table? Is this a real question? Yeah, it's a real question. It's all about, you know, what do you bring to the table? That's, that's what I want to know. Mm, I am the table. Mm -hmm. I'm bringing the table. All right. <laughs> what you bring, Scott? What am I bringing? Uh, some ribs, bro. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's all about experiences. It's all about, you know, that question that says, okay, what do you have to offer? And what, what kind of artists are you? And what are your skill sets? And, you know, that's really what the deeper part of the question is really all yeah, about. So yeah. maybe it's something more to yeah. think about as no. opposed to having to really answer the question. But if you can, chime in. No, you know, I, that's a very good question. You know, I think um, sort of one of my epiphanies that I had was that, you know, we, we're so into our work or our careers or our own journeys that we have acquired all this knowledge and, and, and information and resources. And when you step back for a second and you realize like, oh wow, you know what, uh, you know, I did X, Y, Z, I knew this person, I did that, you know, all these things and, and you become a resource. Mm without really knowing and realizing it because you're so, you know, you got laser vision into, you know, to not be, to not no longer become a, you know, emerging artist. But to that question, like mm -hmm. we're, mm -hmm. like you're always an emerging artist, you know, like you're always, um, you know, in my opinion, you're always growing and learning new things. And like, you, you know, we talk about the artists that you just showed, the more of the iconic ones in the, uh, in the uh, lexicon of black American artists. I mean, they were all, changing as well and evolving, you know, as well. Um, but, it, but we're known for iconic styles, uh, but continue to grow. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question or not. I, I think so. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going because I wanna make sure that we are in schedule. I would like to be able to reclaim some time, but anyway. Uh, is it okay to promote your skills and, and how, to, how do you do that? How do you, how do you promote your skills and how do you do that? So while you were talking about uh, social media, yeah, you know, I haven't, I didn't see no. Do you have TikTok videos on? I just started. <laughs> I just started with the TikTok thing. On, TikTok. I, I try my best to stay away. But, right, right, right. But I, you know, going to say, um, my mindset toward TikTok was more so. I don't know what it was. I just was running from it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I learned to embrace all of these things because they're mm -hmm. tools. Yeah, they're and they're, they're, we are told how to think about things. And when you really apply it to your personal day and what your personal passions and goals mm -hmm. are, everything can be used for the betterment of what mm -hmm. you're doing, mm -hmm. especially with social media, which is a fine line because scrolling and scrolling and scrolling, it's programming. Yeah. So if you can reverse that and use it for your good, it can work in your favor. And I realized also that, you know, years and years of trying to find my place, being an artist and branding and all these things, I kind of let that down and um, realized that I am the art, I am the experience, and I'm just using my skills as an artist to be the tools to convey whatever I need to, you know, convey in that season, because I'm ever changing. So allowing that to be a thing, I'm very excited about where I'm, where I'm going to be because I found a place to be very proud of where I am mm -hmm. now as an artist. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. 
I like that, the experience <laughs> piece. Um, right, yeah. I think, wait, so question. Yeah, skills. is it okay to promote your skills and, and, and how do you do that? I think something that's really interesting about my art practice is that it's not exclusively visual. Um, I'm really interested also in um, music, like I said, and I really wanted to be a journalist when I was coming up, and I've actually incorporated interviewing and dialogue into a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of my work. Um, I think that there are so many things that we as artists get to do. Mm -hmm. um, we, it, we, we have to do so many things, but we also get to do so many things. There's not such a strong box. So you can take whatever your passions are and kind of combine them and then mix it up into something that's totally yours. And yes. I think that's like one of the best parts about the job is that you get to make it every day. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, I, I, I would add to that too. So like, you know, my, my, we all have like different experiences like become before we were practicing artists, right? You know, so a lot of people don't, you don't even know that I was, and I always spent some time as a broadcast designer. So I did, you know, a lot of, you know, um, uh, animations and uh, I was a broadcast designer for a TV station so that's actually how it kind of got started and it being exposed to the technical side of creativity like Photoshop Illustrator at right. the time it was you know it was an in, in its infancy but then I realized it's a what an amazing tool is this is yeah. and uh, yeah. so it just opened up so many other creative avenues um, to really explore um, you know, how you can, can continue to use these tools to, you know, communicate your visual narratives and your stories and, you know, continue to find your journeys as a, as a practicing artist. That's good. That's yeah. great. So I'm, I've got a couple more, but I want to try and turn it up a little bit, you know. So I want you to think about this for the audience. Uh, what does community engagement mean to you? Uh, but not only that, does uh, collaborating efforts uh, promote financial wellness? Uh, that's that's something else I want the audience to think about. But again, you know, th those are things that we talk about often, but a lot of times are not always revealed. Uh, but that's a you know, all this conversation is a good segue to this moment, uh, because based on uh, what you just said, Scott, you know, the artistic process can be transferable across uh, different aspects and sectors of the art world. We just need to know how to uh, channel that energy. Uh, and so the thought is that do you have a strategy for yourself, and and how do you how do you make money? from your art? How, how do you do that? How do, you, what's your, do you have a strategy? Do you have, do you well, I, I guess maybe I can come from a different lens because I'm a gallerist too, so I, you yeah. know, uh, operating and supporting other artists. Um, you know, it's really about, you know, for me, it's really about encouraging artists to drill down into their own practice and drill down into that, you know, why are you doing this? Mm. You know, and it's kind of like this, they have this epiphany, like, okay, well, you have to challenge yourself. Like, you know, why am I doing this? You know, why, what am I trying to gain from this? Is it mm -hmm. financial freedom? Is it, you know, being able to, you know, get paid for my creativity? I mean, there's so many different reasons. And uh, so whatever that is, you know, that challenges to, okay, well, you challenge yourself with that. So create your network or build your resources to accomplish that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I deal with, various artists in various stages of their career um you know but the underlying theme is that there's there's that ongoing um uh journey to to, to find their voice in their work yeah. and to never get you know uh stagnant or or comfortable mm -hmm. um and to keep pushing yeah so here's here's something else too so uh you know so by general definition this is one way of just looking at it um, you know, being an artist, they sometimes tell us that, uh, you know, it's having this ability to cultivate our skills in, in perfecting your talent. And, uh, you know, the other thoughts, as you can see, uh, all of you can, can read this, that this imaginative thinking, you know, along with creating paintings and drawings and sculpture is, is also part of that, you know, that artistic ability. But I want to put this one slide up to give you an idea of all the pathways that you can take. You know, so most of us think that we can be one, that we are one dimensional or other people think that we're one dimensional and we're not. There's more than one pathway to get to some of the careers that we seek. And so I always like to throw, you know, slides like this, uh, you know, in front of us because it shows uh, at least 60 visual art careers that you can um, approach. And so most of, uh, of you out there who are students and if this is the path that you've chosen, 
And hopefully it is a path that you've chosen and not one that you're just following because I think that your unique, your unique skills and abilities will put you on any one of these paths so that you can to see some of that success. So here's the question for not just uh, those of you in the audience, but for those who are on the panel is, uh, so are you, a, are you a creative or are you an artist? Um, I actually <laughs> recently, um, I found myself calling uh, myself a creative when speaking to other people mm. because it was better for them to digest me. Um, because uh, going to school for graphic design, learning programs and such, when I felt intrigued by other things that were on the technical side, mm. I realized that everything was connected. I was learning things so fast because I could see the connection and just fall into it. <clears throat> and if someone approached me for something and perhaps I had an opportunity to work and give them a service for something else, it didn't box them into that one thing that they met me in. Mm -hmm. You know, I was able to provide other things. And it helped me personally to just move more freely in my creativity without having to feel the obligation to fit into something from an outer perspective and just inside of myself create. Good, good. So, uh, Rosie, I want to ask you this. Maybe you can set this in motion, but um, there are plenty of people that claim to be artists. Mm -hmm. uh, so what distinguishes you from everyone else? Me specifically or like? Uh, just in general. I, I don't want to. I don't want to put you on a, a call you um, out, but you know. I don't know. But since you know, Honestly, since you're I, sitting right next to me. I think like maybe it's that other question about how how uh -huh. I figure out how I make money. Yeah. And okay. how that ties uh -huh. into it. I guess yeah. like I am a creative person. However, mm -hmm. my job is an artist. I am an artist. That is what I'm paid to do. I charge artist rates. Yeah. And when I make decisions about how I'm going to move forward with my business, I actually have a quarterly mm -hmm. goals. Like mm -hmm. I set quarterly goals, and I start that at the beginning of the year. Yeah. And like anything that I'm doing in a calendar year needs to be directly in line with the objectives that I set for myself. And I think that's yeah. like a very specific practice. So I, I'm getting paid as an artist. Yeah, good. Okay, great. So I, I want to ask this to the... Uh, uh, I'm going to touch on real quick. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was going to ask you, are we okay, okay. with time? Because I want to make sure that we leave room for the audience because we were on oh, a schedule. Uh, so, I don't know. Uh, so who's <laughs> boss? Who, who's <laughs> boss? Who's the, who, the, who the, the boss? Who's the boss? All right. Thumbs up. <laughs> so we good? Yeah, we got the thumbs up. Okay, good. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Scott, go ahead. Uh, I just want to you know, acknowledge <laughs> Rosie. So Rosie, okay, you know, she's, she's a uh, very prolific um, yeah. Um, artist and a, a business woman. Um, so, did you pay him this pay I was well. fortunate to have uh, uh, Rosie's first show in Racine, <laughs> solo show in Racine. And um, one thing I really loved about Rosie was that a she was on top of her game in terms of of knowing her inventory of of what she had available, um, but also it was diverse. So you know when we talked, she brought you know she had originals and original artwork. There were prints. There were different size prints. There were limited edition uh, remarks. There were postcards. There were posters. There were uh, a few other things, you know. And that's that's being intentional about, like she just mentioned, being intentional about, you know, her practice. Like if this is what you want to do, then you have to do the work. And uh, there's there's so many different avenues. And I think we just often get time, just get um, feel as though we can only do original work. But there's yeah. There's licensing opportunities, publishing opportunities. There's, you know, illustrating uh, opportunities. There's so many out there. Um, but then so that kind of goes to my question that, that yeah. I ask artists all the time. You know, what is it that you want to do? Where are you going with your practice? You know, as a gallery owner, I can't answer that for you. I can help steer you in a direction to help you move toward that. But ultimately, it's 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 you. You know, and what you um, you know what you want to do. Yeah, so that's a, uh, you know, you, you're right on, right on par. So here's, that's get, here's that question. So who, what do you want from, your, from an art career? And, and what challenges do you face? So that's a, that's a question really for everybody, I mean, even for, the, for our audience to <laughs> ponder too. So, so, so did you, you sure you didn't pick up my PowerPoint, man? No, I'm, I'm positive, I'm sure. <laughs> okay. You're just throwing it at us with okay. something. <laughs> okay, so, that, so, so what challenges do you face, by? Well, initially my challenge was understanding where my place was, I guess, in the world mm -hmm. as an artist. Yeah. And it took growth. It took actually being present more so in everyday life yeah. and, and it actually working together and not being a separate thing. So personally, my art has took me into the world of uh, wellness and I'm actually um, gathering a lot of opportunities to um, speak on mental health 
and to teach and to provide art therapy and things like that because I, I managed to reflect and, and take inventory of my experience as an artist and how that has helped me heal mm -hmm. and provide that for people who are, are artists, who aren't artists, but just give, open their mind to what art can do. Mm -hmm. And that's very fulfilling for me and I'm happy that it took me there. I, I faced so many challenges trying to fit in places and make my art fit in things to um, entertain or to satisfy things outside of myself. And um, I value those experiences because it taught me a lot. But mm. it, was, it was very challenging to just find my own identity and confidence in just me and, and embrace what that meant and then really put that into my career because that did matter too. Yeah, that's great. The hardest part, I think, was first accepting that this was really going to be my job. Mm. Like, I didn't really believe that this could be my job. I had to figure out how to take up the amount of space that was required for me to actually do this. Um, which meant getting over some stuff in my own head. But then also, like, not letting other people define what I could or couldn't do mm -hmm. based on who I was or what I had or did not have, whether that was pieces of paper or permission. Um, and the, my goal is just to kind of keep living the life that I want. That's yeah. what my art is for, so that yeah, I can live yeah. the life that I want yeah. to live. Yeah, that, that's a good segue, too. So, so how does one maintain a fully functioning career as an arts professional? So, I mean, Scott, that's the business that, that you're in, and, you know, so. Yeah. Um, well, I think for one, the, the biggest thing is probably, you know, I would say, you know, belief in yourself that, that you can do it. Um, and it's, it's, it's work. <laughs> It yeah. is. It is work. That is for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well, here's another one. I'm gonna just throw this one right in there right now because that's you know I can't help it. Uh, so do you have the proper tools and documents for doing business, and, and that includes like you know contracts, consignment agreements, and you know Rosie, you and I we've arm wrestled a couple times on this. <laughs> uh, artist proposal forms, yeah. a brand identity, uh, a cost matrix. Uh, to be able to price your work, because sometimes that's the hardest thing that artists struggle with is like. You know, how many thousands should I charge? Oh, I mean, just how with prices. <laughs> That's the thing, though. Like, yeah. so when I first when I first started, yeah. I had no idea what to do. And, yeah. like, the first thing I did was, like, I actually called you. Do you oh, remember that phone call? I do. Um, I was standing in the closet at my artist residency. <laughs> and I called him. I'm like, what do I do? And he kind of gave me a quick rundown. He's like, well, you should, do you have this? Do you have this? And I'm like, no. No, no, I don't have that. And then I realized we live in the internet age. So I quickly yeah. got all of those things, but I took notes mm -hmm. on what he suggested and like also took some cues from like, you were like the king of licensing. Like that's yeah. the Topaz whole jam is yeah. like, if you can get an original out of him, you've done a good thing. Yeah. But you know, <laughs> like he's like that stuff and seeing how other artists operated their business. Once I kind of got a feel for the choices, then I just put together what I thought I needed. I didn't start out with everything, yeah. but I just learned a little bit from everybody. Yeah. That's great. You know, I want to add too, so like, you know, Matope is being really humble <laughs> about himself, mm -hmm. okay? He's actually like the Yoda of, you know, artists and art <laughs> in Wisconsin and the United States. I mean, he's, he's a resource for a lot of people, a lot of people who do this every day. So first of all, thank you for that, Matope, okay, just for being a, you know, light for so many people. No, I'm, uh, I'm here. I'm here for you. I'm here for you. Um, but you know, like, yeah, what you, what Rosie said. You know, just those things are important as a gallerist. You know, I kind of like, I was so excited about doing. I want to do this gallery, and I want to have all these artists. You know, yada yada yada, and you know, bringing the artwork. And well, you know, what you, what initially, what I did not think about is that business process of doing that. So. Mm -hmm you know, um, like agreements, you know, contracts, liability. Like uh, that time I dropped off um, artwork with you in the storage space? Oh, uh, yeah, 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 <laughs> that too, yeah. <laughs> right, right. Insurance, you know, because at the end of the day, you know, it, it's, you know, I treat, um, and I got my gallery owner hat, my gallery's hat on, um, but it's important to treat the work not only have the artists treat their work like gold, because it is, but you have to treat the work like gold. So, you know, that means making sure it doesn't get damaged, you know, packaging, really being conscious and intentional about protecting the work. Because, like, for so many artists, you know, this is what we do. This is their livelihood. This is how they support their families. This is how they, you know, 
That's what we eat. Yeah, it's all we eat. You know, so as a gallery, it's your responsibility to make sure that is taken care of, and that's one way to do that is through your, uh, you know, contracts and and uh, uh, other um, instruments, you know, of that nature. Yeah, yeah. So I had kind of, you know, quietly put up the question about uh, how do you help uh, others see what you see, but uh, you know, I want to make sure that we got some room for uh, for questioning. But I, I kind of like. Uh, I'm kind of winding down a little bit, but you know, if JPEG stands for uh, Joint uh, uh, Photographic Experts Group, and PING stands for Portable Network Graphics, and TIFF stands for Image File Format, and EPS stands for Encapsulated Postscript Vector File, what do you do about NFTs? <laughs> NFT. NFT. Not right. an effing thing. <laughs> <laughs> so that so that non fungible token, you, you know, you're not so, you know that that's the question that everybody's t throwing around right now. So, yeah, uh, indeed. But just indeed. a question to ponder. Right? So uh, yeah, it's it's out there. Well, I meant I was yeah. asking the like, oh, She's over there chilling. Yeah. Yeah. In. NFTs yeah. is is uh, a rabbit hole for me yeah. um, because I feel like it was. Uh, it was uh, just trailing on the tail of like the Bitcoin conversations uh, and things yeah, like it that. Is, it certainly and is, yeah. And it, it was a, I don't know, it was a, <laughs> I'm a homebody and I like to create my own mm. in home. And then I love the experience. And there's a lot of people that I respect for having digital artwork, but I'm the digital artist that started on paper. Yeah. And I very much enjoyed that process. And I think that most of my best work starts from my hand. To the thing and you know when I make something I have a lot of friends that rush me with the NFT conversation yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I get a little anxiety because I, I can't understand it but I don't think deep down my, in my spirit I just don't want to I'm not yeah. sure it's something yeah, about yeah. it that I just don't want to attach to yeah. and I'm gonna respect that yeah <laughs> I'm not forcing it so so yeah I was trying to you know kind of compact a, a lot of these questions in, but I want to now open it up for the, the audience to uh, to ask questions if we ha if we have time for that as well. So I know we're at the top of our hour. So um, so is anybody from the uh, audience want to uh, you know fill some questions for our, our artists up here? Yeah. Do we have someone? Is there, do we have a live mic that we can give them? Yeah. You, uh, yeah. Let's see if we can do that. Yeah. So you know this can be something like. Uh, you know, if, if you're an artist, say so, it's kind of like uh, stand up and say, you know, like they do in those uh, AA meetings. You know, I am an, uh, my name is and I am an artist. Go ahead, I wanted you to do that. Can you uh, stand up and ask the question, please? But you gotta, just, you gotta make that statement. My name is and, you know, just like at the AA meetings, can you do that? All right, my name's Trevor. And I just wanna ask uh, the, slide, <laughs> the slide that you went over, like how do you, how do you make sure or help Others see what you see? Yes. That's all I was going to ask. Okay, yeah, Gary, let's go back to that question, yeah. Uh, Thank you. So he's asking, uh, how do you help others see what you see? Any, I, anybody? Um, for me, I would say it comes down to your inner dialogue and your self-belief. Um, mm -hmm. Don't limit yourself. And if you are, quote, unquote, known to do a certain thing, don't let that idea stop you from expanding to other mediums or other um, ideas because it was one thing that happened in our favorite artists in one point in time where they stretched past what they believed or they challenged their own belief. And I think that's very important because I feel that when it comes to ideas, they're just circling around above our heads and you just never know, you know, when something is going to land when you give it space to. And um, I am a very... A uh, loud advocate for a self solitude and meditation. Give yourself that quiet time to understand, and in that same breath, you know, study, and you know, really gravitate to what you like, and let that grow, let that create something. Anybody else? Yeah, well, I'll kind of look at that as a two part uh, question. So, like you say, like, what, how do you, how do you have, what is it again? How do you help yeah. others see, what you see, see what you see? Well, like from an, an artist standpoint or creatively, you know, like, um, you know, you don't, my, my opinion, um, someone sees like the artwork like differently, right? So I don't, you, you shouldn't have, or, you know, it's okay to have two different interpretations of, uh, of, of the same work. Uh, you get something out of it differently based off of your own personal experiences, you know, your own, you know, likes and dislikes and whatnot. Um, another piece of that is, um, 
just really making the personal connection. So helping other people understand how this decision or movement or practice impacts you personally and your people around you that you want to support and your own goals. Um, you know, I've, I have conversations all the time about with artists. Uh, sometimes they don't want to sign their work. And one of the issues that I had, but I had a communication with, uh, you know, an artist, phenomenal artist, um, but he didn't sign his work. And, you know, I, I explained to him that that's a potential issue moving forward. Like when you're no longer here and, you know, and you want to, you know, pass work along to your, you know, your, your family or your children or, you know, put it in a certain collection or some sort of trust. If no one knows it's yours, it could be anybody's. And so you sort of lose that. And then, you know, he understood when I said in that context. And he was looking at it from a standpoint of, artistic standpoint of, well, I don't want to put the signature on because it's going to damage the, you know, the image. You know, I, I get it. I understand that too. But at the same time, you know, if, if, you're, if you're building an art career, you should sign your work for a variety of reasons, that being one of them as well. So I don't know if that kind of adds to that. That's a good point. Uh, any other questions? Any other from the audience? Okay. Um, can we... Um Yeah, okay, good, 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 good. great. Um, I've actually done it to myself at times because um, I have fallen in love with Procreate and I realize though um, it cuts down on my discipline sometimes. I give more energy and more passion when I'm literally dipping paint and experiencing that moment than when I sometimes I'm on the go or in that type of energy of on the go and I'm not really giving it that time personally. So um, I feel like my value is higher when I focus on fine arts and then I have my own formula of pulling my fine art into the digital and then I feel it is better valued that way instead of being completely digital. I just don't connect with it as well. You know, I, I kind of look at it as um, two different worlds, you know, if you will. So, you know, using my, you know, my own personal experience and I started off as a, you know, broadcast designer. So, you know, you're going to have a different audience, okay? So, like, you know, doing, for instance, you know, TV show opens, you know, lower thirds, broadcast graphics, animations. That's a different audience. You know, a fine art collector is probably not interested in that. But a executive producer of a TV show or, you know, a TV network would be interested in that. So you're creating another lane for yourself, more opportunities mm -hmm. in a different space, which you can still continue to do the fine art work, too. So... Um, and that was, that was, that's like literally what I did. You know, I became really good at not to my own horn, but you know, my, my dad always told me, you got a son, you got to be a master of something. You got to learn something yeah. and I really get good at it. You know, so I really got good at, uh, the Adobe products, you know, like I really got great at that. And, um, and I realized like, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I developed a skill set that, you know, people didn't, a lot of people didn't have at the time. Um, which created a, lanes for me to, you know, get income and, you know, support my family, but also I had this other fine art piece was another avenue. So, you know, I'm just a big proponent of really, you know, continue to learn, you know, grow. They're both resources. They're both assets. And art is a big, gigantic umbrella. So he's talking about digital art. There's digital fine art. There's digital, you know, uh, like graphic art. You know, gaming is for another example. That's another form of art with this uh, uh, metaverse. That's another form. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, so really, yeah. And they all, they all kind of interconnect, you know, because he's using some of the same uh, commonalities, uh, but each one has its own, you know, uh, world, if you will. I think actually I want to answer that too, um, <clears throat> and this isn't like an assault on the particular question or you as an asker, but like I think 
that making a line between digital art and other art and questioning whether that's fine art or not. I don't know if that's necessarily appropriate at this point in time because we just talked about NFTs, mm. which is wholly digital. People are running away with money at this point with NFTs. But I think also it's really important to acknowledge that digital art makes art accessible to a lot of people who can't mm. spend money on perpetually purchasing supplies. Like I grew up poor. So for me, like the fact that somebody who was in the same situation as I was, could make art of any medium of their choosing at any size. There isn't really a limitation um, if they have access to the technology. I think it's incredible in terms of accessibility. I think it allows you to be more prolific. I start all of my work digitally, and then I decide if I'm gonna bring that into the real world or mm -hmm. not. Those two things are integrated for me, but they are super, super important in talking about accessibility, especially during the pandemic. That's true. Mm -hmm. And then also, too, I want to add, too, so, like, those those digital skill sets can help the fine art piece That's true. And, and, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So it's important to, you know, have some, you know, base knowledge of, of, of each one. Could I um, add one more thing? Um, the ability to use all these tools, it takes discipline because I myself am a multifaceted artist and a lot of the times it wasn't by choice. I just kind of was really passionate and going through different things. But to make it work as a career, it really just takes discipline because everything deserves its rightful <coughs> amount of time to even understand how they can be cohesive with each other. Uh, anyone else? Any other questions? We got, another one uh, we got a couple. Uh, that one has the microphone. Okay, great. And Rose, you <laughs> brought that. up how the COVID-19 pandemic affected you. How would you guys feel that the COVID-19 pandemic affected the art field, be it financially or creatively? In every, every show that we had scheduled last year, the last two years, everything has turned on its side. Um, I have lost some opportunities, but because people are more open to doing, say, a virtual show, that means I can actually be in more shows. Um, it's, it's a two-sided, a double-sided coin, I guess. Sometimes it's awful, because you can't hang out with your friends and do the stuff you want to do, but then also, like, by virtue of participating in exhibits around the country and not having to leave my house, yeah. I am fine with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's cool, uh, indeed. I, I think with my gallerist hat on, you know, COVID has, um, it's had, significant impacts in a positive way, but also, you know, n negatively as well. But I would say overall, you know, it was, it helped the business, you know, it helped artists, it helped, because um, what was happening, you know, people were at home looking at the walls, right? You know, just tired of looking at these blank walls or these whack walls, you know, but, and, uh, so that sparked a lot of interest uh, really uh, from my experience, people really delving into learning, you know, who are the artists out there? You know, where are they? And, you know, what type of styles? And, you know, so our, you know, the gallery, you know, we, we sold a lot of artwork uh, in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and I would also notice too, which is beautiful, it was a lot of creativity happening in this process. A lot of, a lot of artists were getting back into their craft. Yeah, right. You know, writers were getting back in their craft. You know, it was sort of this, um, um, what's what I'm looking for, a renaissance, if you will, yeah. you know, for lack of a better term. Um, that's how I sort of see it, and I saw it and experienced it. And, um, you know, I just, I think that was really a, a, a time for people to get back into themselves. Yeah, I think it allows us to uh, turn inward. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, I think we have uh, room for maybe one more question. Um, so, uh, yeah, there you go. Give her the mic. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so stand up and give us your AA. Okay. Um, <laughs> hi. <laughs> and your name is? I'm Summer. Um, I'm kind of an artist, or I want to be an artist of a sort. That wrong answer. Yeah. Um, well, that wrong answer. Answer. <laughs> you kind of you want to claim it. So I actually have an art degree here, but I actually inspired to be a character designer at some point. Um, I was just wondering, because obviously you said you were into journalism at one point. What like 
convinced you that you wanted to be something else or what were you scared of anything of even switching at all no I was told journalism was dead so I had to come up with another plan because that was my only plan but if you already have the degree or you're working towards the degree um I think if you can find any opportunity to practice, like if you can find an internship, and a paid internship, pa yeah. a paid, do not take a free internship, a paid internship, or start working on your portfolio independently and just start sending things out. The worst somebody can say is no, but just go for it. You know, say Rosie's a beast when it comes to business. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You know, I, I want to touch on that too real quick. So like, you know, I was a football player. You know, I thought my life was, playing football and that's all I knew at the time for a long time pretty much my whole like childhood and you know probably half of my adult you know uh life before I realized I, I had some other skills like I'm not just a you know you know big linebacker busting heads out there and uh it was actually my mother who convinced me that to explore um long story short you know played fo football college football came back to Wisconsin I'm like okay what do I do now and um She's the one that convinced me to, you know, explore your creative side. Because she, like, saw, saw this creative, artistic talent in, in me as my whole life. You know, I never really realized that. So, um, just, you know, uh, I thank her for helping me see that. And that's always going to be a, a, a lifelong thing, too. You know, we, we've all evolved and we continue yes, to evolve. We have. Yes, we have. Um, it's, it's a, it's a never-ending thing. So I think that uh, we'll just try to wrap it up here. So I want to thank you all for your questions. Uh, thank you for being in attendance. And uh, again, I'd like to thank uh, UW Parkside uh, College of Arts and uh, Humanities, as well as the Office of Multicultural uh, Student Affairs and uh, our distinguished panelists and all of you. And uh, April, it was nice uh, having uh, some correspondence with you. Um, April is the uh, pure year as the program uh, Associate and Colette Espel, uh, she's the one that is handing off the, the mic around here. And mm -hmm. So just give uh, yourselves a round of applause and all the panelists. Uh, again, thank you so much. My name is Matope J. Johnson, and it was a pleasure uh, to be with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.